Good evening, and thank you all for joining us today. Jackson Paul Pharmaceuticals Limited would like to extend warm welcome to this seventh in the series of midlife quality of life issues on neurological problems of menopause. This is an initiative of uh, SAFOMS, who are now uh, looking up all the QOL issues uh, based on the menopause rating scale. So this webinar is in academic partners with smlm.in and Jackson Paul Pharma Limited, makers of Lycoret, Verena, and Divatron. Jackson Paul brings to you Lycoret soft gels, which is found to correct the nutritional deficiencies. It contains natural lycopene as lycomato, serves to enhance the journal health and well-being. We would also like to present to you Divatron, that is 100, uh, 10 mg of Didrogestron tablets, fully indigenized, micronized Didrogestron, the only brand which is having 36 months of shelf life. A warm and hearty welcome to all the esteemed faculty and mm -hmm. attendees present today. Dear attendees, if you have any questions or suggestions, please post them in the Q&A box and they will be attended to. We also shall enable audio of attendees to speak up. So in case you want to interact with the experts, please raise your hand so that your audio can be enabled. Please note this webinar is streaming live on Facebook and the recording will also come up on our YouTube channel, which is Jackson Pal Medical Insights. Now to begin the program, I welcome our Master of Ceremony, Dr. Avir Sarkar. Dr. Avir Sarkar is professor at ESI Hospital and Medical College at Faridabad, India. So, sir, please take up the proceedings from here now. Uh, hello, good evening to one and all. I would like to invite Dr. Professor Maninder Ahuja, ma'am, who is currently President, Society of Meaningful Life Management, she is a thought-provoking leader all over India, and she is the director of Ahuja Healthcare and Infertility and Dental Center. She has around 40 years of dedicated work for women from adolescence till midlife and menopause. She had been the vice president of SEFORMS and web in charge of SEFORMS and secretary general. She was the vice president of FOXI from 2013 to 14 and president of Indian Menopause Society 2014 to 15. She has been the author and editor of more than 100 publications and authored many books. And she is the editor in chief of Journal of Midlife Health. Welcome, ma'am. Thank you, Dr. Avi Sarkar. He's our upcoming young faculty of the Seforms and I think he will be a very useful asset for the Seforms and other professional bodies where he has been working. Good evening, ma'am. Yeah, good evening. You have joined? Right, yes, sir. Yeah, yeah. welcome. Yes, welcome, Dr. Vinit Mishra. He has Thank joined. you, ma'am. Good evening, everybody. I take this opportunity to welcome everybody from the five countries which are making the South Asian Federation of Menopause Societies, and it has been more than 10 years when we have been working and we have made a mark our not at the in the five countries also but at the national and international level 
but before that uh, if i thank uh, I welcome all the delegates and faculty from sri lanka bangladesh pakistan um, and nepal and india uh, before that i would like to welcome our president dr rohana hathatwa he is such a wonderful person at heart and very cooperative but we are, above all he is a academic person who is there in all the international bodies also he is the founder chairman of the nine wells care mother and baby hospital secretary general of the aofag president south asian federation of uh, of, um, of obstetrics and gynecologists and president south asian federation of menopause society president world gestosis organization past chair menstrual disorders committee figo past president sri lanka college of obstetrics and gynecologists and past president sri lanka menopause society sir it is an honor to have you here with us as the president of the seforms and under your guidance i think in the last two years we have done lots of work which will be highlighting later on to you for your opening comments and welcome address dr rohana hathatwa thank you dr maninda for that very very generous introduction uh, uh, firstly <clears throat> i must uh, congratulate and uh, thank uh, dr maninda our vice president of sawams uh, who has been very very active uh, in our federation and she has been the live wire behind all these webinars uh, a series of webinars which she has been conducting over the past few months i know the difficulties she has had uh, in organizing these webinars collecting speakers and panelists and so on but she has uh, uh, continued these uh, programs and so so we are witnessing i think the seventh one today and she has been selecting all these uh, areas uh, concerning menopausal women Uh, other than uh, hot flashes which is always discussed so it's a very very good opportunity uh, very uh, educative experience all these uh, webinars so i once again thank uh, dr manind uh, for all her hard work in organizing these educational uh, webinars even with uh, during these difficult times and i am very happy that today uh this subject of urological problems uh, uh in the elderly has been selected and uh, because urological problems as you know as we all know is a very common problem in the menopausal age but sometimes the women they think this is uh, something to do with aging and that is it's not a problem and so they uh, live with it uh, without complaining so these are things uh, <coughs> uh and but uh, this is coming becoming very very uh, common and uh, so it is a very uh, nice <clears throat> good thing that uh, manind has selected this subject so that uh, we can learn uh, from the experts who will be talking to us so we have dr <clears throat> sharma and dr manoj uh, who will be giving the lectures and then after that there will be this uh panel discussion uh, which i am very happy to see dr vinith mishra after a very long time uh, he has been <coughs> with, uh, associating with us for a, a very long period and has been a wonderful person so i think he'll be moderating the very lively panel discussion and i see from sri lanka also dr chintaka banagala and also dr piyush athwatu who is the president of the sri lanka menopause society and also so there are many others <laughs> from other countries of sofoms india uh, nepal pakistan and bangladesh who will be joining uh, in this program so it's a truly a, a sofoms uh, program so i don't want to take uh, any more time but i we would like to uh, remind all of you that we are having our sofoms biennial conference in islamabad uh pakistan in november 19th and 20th so that will be a very good congress where all these things <laughs> will be discussed and there will be i think already they have organized about 10 workshops pre congress so it it will be a wonderful opportunity for all of us to meet uh, in islamabad pakistan uh, in november uh, in our 
Congress. You know, thank you very much and over to you. Back to you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Rohana, for those kind words. And uh, I always appreciate your kindness and your cooperation in running this organization. Uh, yes, we have done about 11 webinars now, starting from metabolic syndrome. And uh, then we went on to the menopause rating scale. All the symptoms which are there, 11 symptoms we have discussed one by one in one webinar, starting with hot flushes, sleep disturbances, mood uh, changes, anxiety disorders, muscle pains, then uh, sarcopenia, musculoskeletal disorders, and then GSM. And we started the vaginal problem, then sexual disorders. And now we are taking the urological problems of the menopause. So that means we have covered all symptomatology of the webinar. And our endeavor has been to involve the more and more people. So all the four or five countries, they have been very, very actively involved in all these webinars. And we have involved now the younger faculty also and senior faculty also, because we want more and more people to be interested in the CEPHOM. So we have either the talks or the panel discussion where we involve the younger and the senior faculty together. And then we, uh, what we have been now associated with the uh, and multidisciplinary team also. That is very important because menopause is always a multidisciplinary team effort. So we have involved the urologists, we have involved the cardiologists, we have involved the psychiatrists, the sleep therapist, uh, endocrinologist, each and every speciality has been involved so that in these countries it is known that CEPHOMS is working. And now we have been recognized at international level also and Dr. Rohana Hathatwa and the team has been very kind enough to select me as the representative to CAM. So Dr. Rohana, now we have become sort of international. So we have to our report our activities. Of course, we are running a journal also, a newsletter also, and a website also. So uh, under the leadership of Rohana Hathatwa, we are a complete running body, we just have to take it forward now with more speed. So that is what is required. Yeah, today's webinar is on the urological problem. Now we had discussed uh, genitourinary syndrome of uh, menopause in two stages, sexuality problem and the vag vaginal problem. The urological problems I wanted to discuss separately because it involves the urologist also. And then it involves so many other problems besides just the dysuria and the frequency of urine. So we have a good, great faculty from across the four or five countries of the um, uh, CEPHOMS. So we have speakers, Dr. J.B. Sharma, who will be introduced, Dr. Dr. Chil um, Manoj Chilani, who will be talking on the prolapse after his technique, which is very, very important. Urinary problems will be taken up by Dr. J.B. Sharma. Then there will be a great panel taken up by Vineet Mishra, where we have the Dr. Chintka uh, uh, Bangala from the uh, uh, Sri Lanka, Dr. Sadia Hassan from Bangladesh, Dr. Uh, Novera uh, Chukte from Pakistan, and we have other faculties also who are present there. Uh, I think uh, from Nepal, we have Dr. Uh, Babu Ram. I think he has joined now. So over to you now. And we have Dr. Saida Batul. She has joined or not. She's our guest of honor. And along with that, she will be uh, chairing our two sessions of the talks by Dr. J.B. Sharma. And uh, thank you. I'm, uh, I'm, I'm with you. Yeah, I'm she with has you. joined now. Uh, Dr. Avi Sarkar, would you please introduce Dr. Saida Batul, who is our president elect of CEPOMS for the next year? And she is the one who is holding our. Uh, chair, organizing chairperson for the CEPHOMS biennial conference in uh, Pakistan, which is going to be held in Islamabad in November. And all of you are invited in large numbers uh, to the Pakistan. Uh, our visa still has not been cleared, but let's wish that we get our visa also from India. Uh, to you, Dr. Avi Sarkar. Yes, ma'am. Uh, so welcome, Professor Saeed Abatul, ma'am. Uh, she is a graduate from King Edward Medical College, Lahore, visiting consultant at Ali Medical Center at uh, Blue Area, Islamabad, and a visiting consultant for subfertility at ACIMC uh, G10 Markaz, Islamabad, 
She is a patron and president-elect of CEFORMS. Formerly, she has been the chairperson of OBGY at MCHC PIMS Islamabad. She has a lot of publications to her credit, and uh, she has a special interest in maternal health, subfertility, and menopause. Welcome, ma'am, to chair this session. Thank you. Thank you, you for introduce the first speaker. A uh, few words, Dr. Saida Batu. Yes, ma'am. Introduce the. I think you have spoken quite a lot, and Rohana has very nicely uh, elucidated. Awesome. And thank you, Maninder, for these uh, seminars. Uh, I would just like to add. Uh, by inviting everyone to the SAFORM's uh, uh, biennial conference we are running, and we are planning it on 18th and 19th of November, which is Saturday and Sunday. And those who cannot join, we are trying that we will have it on Zoom as well, so that more people can join and uh, yeah, uh, take a uh, benefit from this. <laughs> uh, yeah, and moreover, I think you would be all excited to know we've had, I think, uh, five or six pre-conference workshops on yes. different aspects of menopause and we are planning about 13 pre-conference workshops on all aspects including the urogynecological, the lifestyle, the vasomotor symptoms, menopausal HRT and all the diverse that we've been doing all the seminars on. So I think the very fact that Maninder has taken so much interest and we're meeting every month, this, this spirit is taking on and everywhere we are looking into the post-reproductive life of women with a new look. And I hope that this will benefit women of our region and we learn from each other and we do better for our women. Thank you, Maninder. And thank you, Rohana, for a very kind introduction. Thank you, thank you so much, ma'am. Uh, may I uh, take this opportunity to introduce our first speaker, Dr. J.B. Sharma, sir. Dr. J.B. Sharma, sir, is currently working as Thank professor you. at uh, All India Institute of Medical Sciences, New Delhi. He was the ex-professor at Maulana Azad Medical College, New Delhi. He has worked at St. Bartholomew Hospital at Homerton University Hospital and Whips Cross University Hospital at London, UK for four years. He has been awarded with the prestigious Dr. B.C. B. C. Roy Award by Honorable President of India in 2015 for research in gynecology. And he has more than 350 publications in indexed and non-indexed journals. He has been the author of many books and edited two books and written five chapters in various books. He won the Indian Council of Medical Research Amrut Modi, Modi Uni Chem Prize for his research work in obstetrics and gynecology. Over to you, sir, and welcome to you. Thank you very much, Dr. Maninda and, and team. I'm really overwhelmed by your calling me here. So as I said, we know that, uh, you know, the various various symptoms which can happen in menopause can be vasomotor symptoms, genitourinary syndrome of menopause, osteoporosis, cardiovascular disease, sexual dysfunction, cognitive decline. So all these can happen. And as Dr. Maninder told me that genitourinary syndrome has already been discussed and others have been discussed in other uh, these things. So we'll restrict ourselves to urological problems. So dementia is also one of them. It can also, uh, you know, uh, so uh, it can also be a manifestation of this. And WHO study also quoted uh, cognitive aging for it. Next slide, please. But we'll restrict mainly ourselves to uh, uh, urological problems today. So next slide, please. I'm moving, yeah. Okay. So vulvovaginal atrophy or genitourinary syndrome of menopause, little bit, I mean, I'll just uh, quickly do so. Right? So it's seen almost in 50% patients. I want to discuss it because it is responsible for urogenital atrophy and it is responsible for urological symptoms. So many patients have dysuria, urgency, frequency, burning, which is no recurrent UTI because of vulvovaginal atrophy. So there be, may be dryness, itching, burning sensation, pain, which is not related to sexual intercourse and dyspareunia. Next slide, please. Okay. okay. So this is because of uh, genitourinary syndrome of menopause, because of loss of superficial epithelial cells, thinning of tissue, genitourinary tract, fragile epithelial tissue, tears, bleeding, fissures, loss of vaginal rugosity, vaginal narrowing, and dyspareunia. Next, please. So all these are related to hypoestrogenic state and topical estrogen can help in that. Yeah, and this is the mechanism of it. Yeah, okay. So I won't go into detail of that, but all of you are aware of it that there is a, because of estrogen lack, that there is thinning of vaginal mucosa and because of that thinning, vagina and urogenital atrophy occurs, patients become more prone for various urogenital 
symptoms including urgency, frequency, and other features. And uh, prolapse, which will be discussed by Dr. Manoj Chilani after me. Next, please. So, this is because of uh, retinal syndrome of menopause, because of lack of estrogen content in menopausal patients. And that will cause the various symptoms and signs. So, these are the various symptoms and signs. Uh, of uh, related to genital syndrome of menopause, uh, you know, that means rugosity will decrease, thinning of the mucosa will occur, and that will be responsible for post portal bleeding, post uh, you know, erythema, redness, symptoms of, you know, genital atrophy. But uh, this topic has already been covered in detail, so I won't go into detail of that, but I'll respect to urogenital problem. Next, please. So, sexual function is one because of general dryness and dyspareunia, sexual dysfunction occurs, and the patients, uh, you know, again, in, in absence of estrogen. So again, a management of GSM quickly, I'll discuss, though it has been discussed, that patient will have, because of of vaginal atrophy, there will be thinning of vagina, there will be, you know, uh, small uh, uh, functional vagina for coitus. So all these, and when we do, actually, usually laboratory investigation, not done, it's a diagnosis, is mainly clinical, but we may do vaginal pH, and then, you know, pH will become, uh, and vaginal maturation index may be informative in them. So pH more than 4.6, maybe as high as 7, indicates vaginal atrophy. So treatment option for GSM quickly, I mean, usually we can use moisturizer for these patients, but mainly water or silicone based lubricants, especially the sexual dysfunction. But more important than we, I tend to prescribe them like topical estrogen therapy for one to two weeks, I give it daily. You can give Primarin gel, you can give, uh, you know, two, a couple of brands are available. So that is initially uh, daily for one to two weeks, later on twice weekly for three months initially, but can be continued for longer period also. The uh, uh, absorbed dose will be less with that, and the chances you don't require progesterone therapy normally. So, estrogen option, topical estrogen, vaginal tablet, ring or battery, and you can even use like dehydropin and endostone also locally. These are some newer drugs, and laser therapy can also be used, but mainly, most commonly used is the topical estrogen therapy. And we can, systemic estradiol levels can be maintained, low dose method can be used, and vaginal creams can also be used. So usually oral, uh, oral, uh, I mean, uh, this thing normally we don't use, but we can use like, you know, local Avalon cream, Primarin cream, Estes cream, locally, they, they are like twice or thrice a week, as I told you. So, I mean, initially daily for a week, like, later on twice weekly for three months initially. So, these will help in uh, uh, urogenital atrophy. They will improve her urinary symptoms also, like urgency frequency will also be increased. And then we can use ospinothin that will increase BMD also. And relief of vaginal atrophy. And then the various urogenital symptoms will also improve. So, estrogen therapy may mo is most effective for moderate to severe urogenital atrophy. Low dose therapy preferred, as I already told, that daily for a week, later on twice weekly for three months. And after estrogenization of vagina in three to four months, systemic absorption of estrogen decreases. We can use osmiumphene also, and that is uh, FDA approved, 60 milligram one cycle. These are the various symptoms related to, uh, uh, I mean, uh, uh, urgency or bladder symptoms. Patient can have urgency, frequency, dysuria, recurrent UTI, nocturia, SUI, mixed urinary incontinence, and prolapse. How uh, the prevalence of urinary symptoms is fairly high, may go up to like 30 percent, 25 to 30 percent. But prevalence of many bladder symptoms such as frequency, urgency, incontinence um, increase around the menopause. And impact of menopause varies with individual symptoms, stress urinary incontinence being associated more with estrogen deficiency than urgency incontinence, which seems to be more age related. So, the, the prevalence of stress appears to peak perimenopausally, 45 to 49 years of age, while prevalence of urgency incontinence increases generally with age. And incontinence in postmenopausal women occurs more often than other civilization diseases such as diabetes, hypertension, or depression. So, these are the various possible mechanisms by which estrogen deficiency may result in lower urinary tract dysfunction. Like urethral dysfunction uh, will be affected, reduce urethral closure pressure. So that will cause reduced urethral blood flow, reduce urethral cell maturation, reduced alpha adrenergic receptor sensitivity in urethral smooth muscle. And then tetrodial function is also affected, increased sensitivity, so more chance of urgency. And then in general, also like recurrent UTI because of uh, uh, thinning of vaginal mucosa and urogenital atrophy. So atrophy of vaginal and urethral epithelium, decline in central effect of estrogen on receptor. So all these will cause more of urgency frequency and UTI. So management is usually conservative. Lifestyle intervention and behavioral therapy. Dr. Uh, uh, Manindra Hoja, ma'am, has been for last more than two decades, he has been highlighting lifestyle intervention, yoga, behavioral therapy. In all conferences, ma'am makes it a point that she actually teaches them and I'm really a fan of her for that. So, and same way, we can ask them to decrease smoking, cessation, weight loss, management of constipation, time voiding during the day, 
fluid intake management and reduction in consumption of caffeine and alcohol. This is very important because caffeine tea, uh, you know, so I was in King's College London, actually, that's what I, I learned there, that patient has to identify what are her uh, urinary irritants. Like for me, it may be caffeine. For my friend, it may be coke. You know, like that. Some For some, it may be alcohol. So we have to find our urinary irritants and we have to avoid those things. The time voiding and fluid restriction are effective first line strategy, especially for urinary urine incontinence. Because, and I have another scene I've seen that many patients, Dr. Maninda, they are drinking like three liters, three and a half liters of water or other drinks every day. They feel that excess of water will improve their skin texture and all. They will become more beautiful and all. But you know, I, uh, 1.8 to 2 liter of water is needed by the body. More than that will make them more uh, uh, to have urgency and frequency. So do, don't drink more than 2 liters per day. Next, please. So these lifestyle changes are very, very crucial. And then bladder training is another important thing. In this case, basically, it aims to decrease voiding frequency to every 2 to 3 hours is usually with, with urge incontinence. So we have to ask the patient, like, you know, how many hours she can hold. If she can't hold like more than two hours, one and a half, two hours, so we can start with one and a half hour. Then we every week we increase by 15 minutes. So like first week, one and a half hour, then one hour, 45 minutes, then two hours. And gradually our aim is to take it to three hours or three and a half hours. Then pelvic floor muscle training is a very useful uh, exercise. A woman can improve muscular support of bladder, neck and proximal urethra before and during an intake in intra-abdominal pressure, thus preventing stress associated with urinary leakage. So pelvic well, muscle training, I, I always tell them, pelvic floor exercise, you know, fecal exercises, they are good for health, they cost nothing. In fact, I, I, I always advise my patient that whenever you are at red light, always keep your muscles contracting. So this has to be done twice a day. I was in Canada in a con Eurogany conference just last week only. And then they say to minimum 15 to 20 minutes twice a day is to be done. And another thing, uh, Dr. Nindra, I learned is that, you know, they, they someone taught me there that if you uh, yoga can also be used. So when I'm breathing exercises, so whenever we are taking deep breath, so when we take deep breath, the abdominal like the diaphragm goes down, then abdominal contents go down and touch the pelvic floor, pelvic floor contacts, then we exhale. So pelvic floor again contacts. So they said you, you can do exercise 15 to 20 minutes in a day, but this breathing exercise you can do almost whole day. So this is a better uh, pelvic floor exercise. I was quite amused by that. So that can also be done. And we can use the biofeedback or vaginal cone, but that is not mandatory. I mean, we can just train our patient to do good pelvic floor exercises. So basically, then medical intervention, I mean, that will depend upon the condition of the patients. Like, especially in for products, Dr. Malochil and I will discuss that. Then anticholinergic mechanism like tolterodine, solifanacin, darifanacin, oxybutynin, they can be given for urge incontinence. So that will, I won't recommend you to prescribe 10 different medications. But I mean, I have seen that solifanacin 5 mg or darifanacin 7.5 mg once a day can be tried for three months initially, one of the two. Oxybutynin usually we don't use these days because that causes more dry mouth. And then another drug is mirabagnol, beta-3 adrenergic agonist. That is, so, but what I have learned is that those patients who have got closed angle glaucoma or those patients who have got anticholinergic side effects, in them mirabagnol is a drug of choice. Mirabagnol is given in dose of 25 mg once a day. Maximum dose we can go is up to 50 mg a day. But because it is a beta-3 adrenergic agent, the patient of cardiac disease should be avoided mirabagnol. So what I use in my clinical practice, madam, those patients who have got cardiac disease or hypertension, I use anticholinergic for them. Those patients who have got side effects with anticholinergic drugs or who have got closed angle glaucoma, then I use mirabagnol for them. If the patient doesn't have any contraindication, we can, I mean, and the patient is responded partially to like say 5 mg of solifanacin. Both are dose, increase the dose to 10 mg, but that will cause more side effects. Other option is that I can add mirabagnol 25 mg to that. So we can combine the two. In that case, I mean, addition uh, usefulness will be there, but side effect will not be multiplied. So that one can also be done. In my clinical practice, madam, about 60% patients are on uh, solifanacin or darifanacin. About 30% patients are on mira background, and only 10% patients are using combination of the two. So, and then we can, of course, topical estrogen therapy I already discussed. And laser method, I don't use them personally, not widely. And the recent meta-analysis, unfortunately, didn't favor them. But definitely many people are using them for vaginal rejuvenation and the, the serogenital atrophy. So only thing the cost is probably like a, say 20, 25,000 rupees every six months. So maybe those rich patients who can afford like uh, vaginal rejuvenation, so that may have some therapeutic effect on, on their SUI urge incontinence also. But the patients which I'm seeing at AIM, you know, they want a definitive permanent cure. So I tend to put a tape in them or I tend to do burst call for suspension. That will be, uh, I mean, one, one procedure useful for whole life. 
so that will be more suitable for them i we can't afford like using laser every every 6 months 20 to 30000 rupees so but but it definitely some people are using that that will call vaginal and urogenital so these are the various i mean uh, laser therapy and uh, rf therapy and then surgical treatment if the patient has got uh, genuine stress incontinence then i th- we can use mediuthal sling like transoperator or retropim suspension or flow special sling we can use rectus sleeve or facial letter but for post suspension we can use prolapse surgery in some cases will resolve stress and urgency symptoms the patient has got prolapse with gastro urinary incontinence then when i am doing prolapse surgery in that concomitant that may help in stress urgency also but usually if the patient has got smear i tend to combine prolapse surgery with tape in those patient so this is done for severe stress incontinence not according to medical treatment so this is the tot tape of johnson company next please which, which i am quite of will be used and then if only problem is that you know the some patients and there was recent scares of uh, uh, mass erosion and in uk these tapes are no longer available so then we gave this to our post graduate and this is the uh, like autologous rectus facial sling surgery we did it on about we have completed now about 35 patients and in only one case we had bladder injury in one case we have small bladder injury in initial phase so what we do when we create a tape of about 8 into 1.5 cm long from the rectus facia and then we uh, put the patient in lithotomy position and then vaginally i uh, make a 2.5 to 3 cm incision on the vaginal wall separate the vaginal mucosa from urethra just like in tot and then from above i uh, go into the cave of rigius and i put a uh, clamp from above and then you know uh, a lateral to uh, bladder neck and then from below the assistant will make a tiny stab at the tip of this and then will feed me the tape on the on the tape on either side we put nylon stitching so i bring those nylon stitches at, at, at you know the mid urethra and then i bring them anterior to the rectus seat and tie them and we take up an artery forceps you can say behind uh, below the tape so that we don't make the tape too tight same way we put an artery forceps when we are tying the stitches abdominally so like that's so ultimately this is this is like a tvt tape uh, but we use the only patient's own tape which is free of cost it will not cause any mass erosion and uh, like very we will only think the operation is bigger as compared to the normal and like the tvt tape or tvt tape next please so we had done almost 37 cases by now and uh, like we are quite happy and satisfied and with this and uh, these are the various like you know uh, uh, recurrent urinary tract infection post menopausal women you can use like you know we can avoid it. this many patients are coming with recurrent uti so in this patient again we can use vaginal estrogen we can use vaginal lactobacilli cranberry or dimeno juice can be used or their tablets are also available and then new strategy like oral immunostimulant vaginal vaccine bladder inspiration with gag so these are just existing but usually a patient of recurrent uti i tend to give them low low dose therapy of uh, like uh, nitrofurantoin uh, after treating them for 1 to 2 weeks then i give them 50 to 100 mg daily for 3 months or so as a suppressive therapy but along with we can give with cranberry extract to these patients or topical estrogen therapy uh, to patients who have got recurrent uti so this statistical data show that only one third of patient under undertake treatment attempts unfortunately often people affected by this problem believe that the only form of treatment is surgery urinary tract infection urinary incontinence can lead to serious complications if left untreated so treatment is very important that's what i tell them that even if you have to take antibiotic for 3 weeks or so let it be we have to make her urine clear and then later on we can put on suppressive therapy but it should be clear that if the urine culture is growing bacteria then we have to treat it with full treatment Like nitrofurantoin, hundred milligram twice a day, or at, uh, my, uh, like uh, sustained release twice a day, or whatever it is. So sometimes two, three to four weeks we may use, and later on, once the urine culture is dry, then only you put on uh, like hundred milligram per day for three to six weeks. So this is my so uh, my take home message. So in in other words, basically most of the urogenital uh, uh, syndrome or symptoms are occurring in this menopausal age group. So partly because of the local estrogen lag. so and uh, like you know dental urinary syndrome of menopause which has already been covered and so the main because of urogenital atrophy patient will have symptom of urge incontinence stress incontinence and patient have urogenital atrophy recurrent uti and all so depending on the condition i mean we can prevent it from from that or we can treat it with the help of topical estrogen therapy daily for one week then twice weekly for three months If the patient had got stress incontinence with stress incontinence i tend to put surgical treatment for them either in the form of tvt tot that is face sling or even recently we have done three cases of uh, like uh, you know uh, tot tape using uh, facial letter uh, with the help of our uh, 
I mean, fully from surgical department. So a minimum three months of conservative treatment to be advised for patients with SUI. Bladder training advice for six weeks initial treatment for urgent contrast. Medical therapy, the recommended therapy for urgent contrast. So for urgent contrast, we tend to use anticonvulsant drugs, solifenacin or daripenacin, uh, like initially for three months, but we can easily give up to three years. And next place, and the or mira background can also be used 25 gigabytes. Again, so decision to start. So I mean, I think I can finish my talk here because then the like oral uh, HRT is not usually required for these patients. But mainly we, we tend to give them topical HRT therapy. So need for systemic therapy is very rare that if the like post statement and all and then uh, historical alone type alone. I won't go into detail of that. That has already been covered many times. And I think Dr. Maninder will cover that. So thank you very much. In the end, I'll just summarize everything that most of these conditions are either because of estrogen lack or which topical estrogen can help. But if they have got genuine stress in content, then they will require surgical treatment. And if they have urgent content, they will require anticonvulsant drug or mira background. So by this, most of the patient, 90 to 95 percent patient can be helped at least if not cured. And almost 70 to 80 percent patient can be cured also. So please do look after these patients very well. They will be really benefited. They will be really helped. And their you know, quality of life will improve so much that they will really bless you. Thank you very much. And again, thanks Dr. Maninder for giving me this opportunity. Uh, thank you, Dr. J.B. Sharma. That was a very, very wonderful talk. But before that, I'll request Dr. Saida Batul to give her comments. Um, uh, thank you, Maninder. It was fantastic. And uh, I think the, a very balanced view. And I think the message is absolutely clear that for urge urinary incontinence, it is a medical treatment. It is the bladder training that matters. While the surgical interventions are useful in the uh, stress urinary incontinence and because now they are not recommending the meshes and the various prosthetic things so uh, it was very exciting to see the rectus uh, being uh, used for this purpose and I hope that this takes on well and we can also learn these activities uh, skills uh, and it was really nice to see this uh, intervention as well. Thank you Maninda. Thank you, Dr. Sandhavati. Dr. Devi Sharma, can you highlight something more about the vaginal vaccines? Yeah, I mean, I mean, I even I don't know much about it. I just read in the literature, ma'am. They are coming. It's not yet available in India, but they are trying to make some vaccine in US and uh, in various countries. So, if available, it will be maybe it will be just like a, a roll of like vaginal, you know, microbiome just like they are making in uh, in bowel this thing. So, but it's still not very, very successful yet. Experimental. Which one would you like to use lactobacilli for patients which are available for vaginal use or oral? Yeah, I mean, vaginal also are available. Like one, this company, Eva Niva, Eva New comes. So that can be used after treating the vaginitis. Then we can use Eva New for five to 10 days for these patients. Or yeah. other options are like oral or yeah. ecoflora, live bio. They can be used one BD for one month. Then one OD for two months. They are oral preparation which contain one billion uh, uh, you know, lactobacilli or so. So they can also be used. They are, I'm finding them useful in patients of recurrent UTI. Another thing, and it recurrent vaginitis. Another thing I'm finding it meant those patients like, you know, whose husbands stay away. Like I got uh, many, more than 300 patients of mine who have got recurrent UTI, recurrent vaginitis. So many, 80% of them are those like husband is in BSF or CRPF working in uh, uh, like uh, uh, Kashmir comes after three to four months. So suddenly like the lady is basically is in celibacy stage for three months and after three months sudden excessive sexual activity. And invariably then she has like, you know, UTI as well as vaginal this thing. So I tend to encourage them that you tend to stay with your husband if possible, you know, go together. And because if there's a regular sexual activity and topical moisturizer, topical estrogen therapy that may help them. Or, or sometimes I put them on like, you know, a low dose, uh, of say, antibiotic and no dose of this thing or like say 50 milligram fluconazole, you know, weekly for, for three to six months. Right? It's uh, very excellent. And uh, Dr. Zinnath Ara from Nasreen is giving very nice comments about the webinar. Thank you, Dr. Zinnath Ara. Dr. Jenny Shabha, I'm very much impressed with one of your comments about the yoga and deep breathing exercise. Whatever we, uh, belongs to us, actually, and now we are relearning it from the best. I Absolutely. just tried those deep breathing. I just tried that deep breathing exercise, and it's a good, better than the Kegel exercises, because when we are doing deep breathing, 
take your uh, it should be with the abdomen out breathe out breathing in but the abdominal muscle should be out like you are filling up your abdomen with air and actually you are contracting your urethral Belly muscle floor. absolutely are contracting i tried it just now and i think that is a very very good suggestion which you have learned and perhaps i think in all the webinars in all your lectures please um, uh, emphasize about this thing because it is effective and easy to do and easy to learn rather than the kegel exercises the deep breathing inside and outside um, thank you dr uh, jb sharma any questions from anybody else please uh, otherwise, we'll move on and the end of the session, we'll take up the questions again. Dr. Amir Sarkar, please, Dr. Manoj Chilani is there. Uh, so welcome, Dr. Manoj Chilani, sir, who is uh, the director of Ayush Hospital and Test Tube Baby Center at Raipur. He is the chairperson of Urogynecology Committee of Indian Menopause Society. He has been the past president of Raipur Menopause Society, organizing chairperson of IMS Urogynecon 2023, Founder Vice President Raipur Isopark, Chairperson of Medical Disorders Committee of uh, Pregnancy uh, Foxy, Past President of Raipur OBGY Society, and many other societies. He has been the Vice President of uh, Chhattisgarh IMA. Over to you, sir, and welcome. Thank you. Thank you so much. And I thank all the organizers for inviting me for this talk. And uh, uh, today, my talk is on prolapse after hysterectomy. So over the years, the incidence have been reduced a lot because of the good uh, surgical skills. So it is most distressing to the to find a patient uh, back uh, coming back to us and complaining there's something coming out per genum after a hysterectomy. So this really gives a nightmare to the surgeon and uh, it really disrupts the interpersonal relationship with the uh, patients. So um, uh, tackling of vaginal wall. Prolapse is relatively rare and uncommon, and knowing the aftermaths of hysterectomy, it takes time for a gynecologist to mentally get tuned to the fact that patients require repeated uh, surgery. So it's really, I mean, uh, very uncomfortable for the doctor also to uh, let the patient know that uh, there's a prolapse and she'll be requiring another surgery. So post-hysterectomy vaginal prolapse, uh, it's a descent of the vaginal cuff scar below a point that is two centimeter less than the total vaginal length above the plane of the hymen. And the common complication following vaginal hysterectomy is the negative impact on women's quality of life due to their associated urinary problems, uh, then anorectal problems, and al also there's a sexual dysfunction. So women is really uncomfortable when after hysterectomy she faces these kinds of problems. And a clear understanding of the supporting mechanism for the uterus and vagina is important in making the right choice of corrective procedure. So it's very important for the surgeon to do the right procedure and do it completely. And he should be, he or she should be well versed with the procedure so that there's no complications later on and patient doesn't turn up again. So the, 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 there are certain risk factors which should lead to the prolapse. They are the age, poor tissue conditions, then scar tissue, there's an increased abdominal pressure. There's uh, women working in certain uh, uh, situations where there's a lot of increase in abdominal pressure. Then there are certain neuropathies, obesity, previous pelvic surgery, and associated medical conditions. So it's very, very important that while we are uh, taking up the patient for hysterectomy, we should take a proper history and detailed examination should be done. So uh, important thing is why post hysterectomy? Because hysterectomy causes the attenuation of the cardinal and uterosexual ligament complex when they excise during hysterectomy. So the separation of the pubic cervical fascia from the rectovaginal fascia is there. There's a separation of the pubic cervical fascia, rectovaginal fascia from the cardinal or uterosexual ligament complex. And the, pa the patient will present with the uh, pelvic heaviness, she will complain of uh, backache and she will uh, present with the mass bulging into the vaginal canal or out of the vagina. Date, makes, uh, date may make standing and uh, walking very difficult and she may also have a urinary incontinence or she may have a vaginal bleeding. So most vaginal cuff prolapse include a pical entrocele where the pu pubic cervical and rectovaginal fascia have separated. Peritoneum becomes stretched and comes in direct contact with the vaginal epithelium, creating a true hernia. And the vaginal epithelium is stretched and becomes very smooth without rugae. And there's always some degree of high cystocele formation and high rectocele formation associated with the vaginal wall prolapse. 
So management, as far as management is concerned, uh, uh, pelvic floor exercises, but there's no strong evidence regarding this. Passive have been used, uh, but they have limited use and uh, they are used mainly used when the patient is unfit for surgery. So when we talk about the surgical management, the question is whether we should go for abdominal route or the vaginal route. So if we have done the vaginal surgery, but uh, vaginal prolapse uh, the treated uh, through transvaginal route, or if uh, we have done the abdominal through the abdominal route, then it's better. Or uh, we have do, uh, done by lapro lapro laparoscopic hysterectomy or use the harmonic vessel seal, then it's better to go through trans abdominal route. Or if there's a failure of previous vaginal approach, or there's a short for four shortened vagina is there. So in all these cases, abdominal route is preferred. But the things to be considered are the what is the pathology of the prolapse. What's the age of the uh, what's the patient age, and what are the expectation of the patient, and what are the sexual functions? How how much sexually she is uh, what you call it uh, active, and it mainly also depends upon the expertise of the surgeon. It depends upon the surgeon to surgeon. They have certain you know uh, how uh, competent they are in certain surgeries. So the when we look at the classification of the D lens is vagina supports. It is classified into level one, level two, and level three. Level one is proximal. So in, when there's a defect, it leads to utovaginal prolapse, wall pro prolapse, and anthrocene. Level two is mid-vaginal, and its defects leads to anterior and posterior wall defects and SUI. And level three is distal vaginal, and its defect leads to lex uh, perineum, low rectocele, and anal incontinence. So prolapse first degree is vaginal apex is visible when uh, perineum is depressed. In sec secondary degree, apex extends just through the introitus. And in third degree, upper two third of the vagina is outside the introitus. And four in fourth degree, entire vagina is outside the introitus. So pre-operative uh, assessment of site of damage should be done. Determine pre-operatively whether lower urinary tract dysfunction and defecatory function also coexist. And the configuration of abdominal wall, sacral promontory, is just fine, depth of pelvis and previous surgery with resulted additions. So one must look all into all this before we plan the things. Dynamic analysis by MRI, technical error is that the patient is evaluated in recombinant rather than the standing position. So uh, I'm not sure how much it can be useful. The dynamic, dyna dynamic pelvic floor, uh, fluoroscopy also accurately identifies anthrocene. Uh, now, when we go for vaginal route, there are procedures like Meckel's caldoplasty, sectospinous ligament fixation, high uterosacral ligament suspension with facial reconstruction, iliocoxygeous facial suspension, and mesh Abdominal, there is abdominal sectoral corpopexy, high uterosacral ligament suspension, and laparoscopic approaches also there. Then there are obliter obliterative methods, which is reforced partial colpoclasis, introitral tightening, or colpectomy. So in Meckel's caldoplasty, a wedge of posterior vagina wall and peritoneum is removed, enterocele sac freed and excised, and the two internal suture plays approximately both uterosectal ligaments and posterior peritoneum, and one external suture through uterosectal ligament, post peritoneum, and brought out through posterior vaginal wall. This obliterates cul-de-sac, supports vaginal apex, and lengthens posterior vaginal wall. Now, when we talk of high uterosectal fixation with facial reconstruction, that is Richardson technique, in this identif identifying the defect in the endopelvic fascia, reducing enterocele sac, then closing of facial defect is done, resuspension of vagina to the original level one support. Non absorbable sutures are put through uterosacral uh, at a level of ischial spine and tied across the midline to form a ridge to which vagina is to be anchored. Absorbable sutures are used to support anterior and posterior vaginal wall to the uterocervical UCL ridge. These are tied to suspended vagina in the the biggest risk is injury to the ureter. So we have to be very careful as far as this procedure is con uh, concerned because there are 10.9% chances uh, of uh, ureteric injuries is there due to its proximity to the anterior border of the uterosacral, especially at the level of the cervix. Now, sacrospinous ligament fixation 
principles uh, to follow while dissecting to reach sacrospinous ligament, wo work lateral to the rectal wall, go posterior to uterosacral ligaments, and start dissecting cranial to levator belly, pierce pa parasacral uh, ligament, locate uh, sacrospinous uh, ligaments, and uh, take sutures through uh, sacrospinous ligaments. Suspending the wall with pulley stitch or placing sutures through full thickness of the vagina. Now we talk about the iliococcygeal facial suspension. Repair any anterior compartment defect. Iliococcygeal muscles identified lateral to rectum and anterior to the steel spine. Sutures place anterior to steel spine and pass through vaginal apex. The vault held with LEs and pushed up. Incision is made on the infra umbilical midline. Incision is taken and pre preparation of vaginal vault. Peritoneum or vault is incised and a plane developed between the posterior wall and rectum. And bladder base, base is dissected of the superior uh, aspect of the anterior vagina. And the preparation of sacrum, the segmoid is pushed to the left and peritoneum over promontory and first uh, three sectoral vertebrae incised and continue to the sector uh, to the vaginal incision. So uh, placement of mesh, uh, mesh is done. Tape mesh suture to the vaginal tissue using the full thickness of interruptive non-absorbable sutures and continue entirely taking care of any cystose. And tape or mesh is turned backwards towards apex and then towards the sacrum and secure to the sacrum. And then the reperitonization re re is done. And uh, when we talk about the hydrotherapy facial reconstruction, uh, reducing enterocele sac by multiple sutures through uh, uterosectal uh, ligaments, closing facial defects, and resuspension of vagina to support level one uh, to, uh, to vagina to the original level one support. We can do it laparoscopically also. Rise in ad adoption of laparoscopic approach is, all, is already there. Advantage is there's improvement in hemostasis, there's improved visualization of anatomy, there's reduced hospital stay and post-operative pain, and there's reduced overall cost. But there are certain disadvantages, like it's technically diffi difficult in reti uh, retroperitoneal dissection. There's a steep learning curve is there, and there's an increased operative uh, room time, increasing cost. And there's a risk of injury to the vital structures. So one has to be really well versed with the laparoscopic uh, procedures to undertake this. Uh, then we talk about the lap sacrocolpopexy, uh, uh, a Y-shaped mesh with one proximal arm and there is two distal arms. The bladder and bowel has been dissected from the vaginal wall and the distal arm uh, was sutured to the posterior vaginal wall and the proximal arm was sutured to the sacral promontory and the reperitonization was completed to prevent boil adhesion to the mesh from vaginal wall along pelvis uh, and sacrum. And there's a leaf foot colpoclasis and colpectomy, small calyx repair in SUI, uh, uh, marking out rectangular triangular flap on the anterior and posterior vaginal wall is done and repeated successive stages to invert the tissues. Then the suturing of uppermost horizontal part of reticular flap to each other with delayed absorbable suture. So the small perineal repair is done if necessary and to supplement, do it in tritial tightening if there's an extreme uh, laxity is there. So for prevention, macular scalduplasty at the time of vaginal hysterectomy is a recommended measure to prevent anterocele formation and uh, suture, suturing the cardinal and uterosacral ligament to the vaginal cuff at the time of hysterectomy is a recommended measure to avoid wall prolapse and sacrospinous fixation at the time of vaginal hysterectomy is recommended when the wall descends to the enteritis during closure. And it's rightly said that surgery should fit the patient and the patient should not fit the surgery. Thank you so much for the patient listening. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Manoj Chirani. I think you have covered it nicely, all the aspects. Dr. Saida Batul. I think it is uh, very good that we have shared all the surgical options in considerable detail and it is i think we need to remember that not all surgeons are expert in every procedure and we should have this uh, uh, ethics and a uh, way that uh, whoever is the best expert in a particular procedure which is suitable for that patient should be doing that surgery i think this remains a very important dictum which most of us are practicing 
but it should it is very important to learn different procedures so that's all i would like to say thank you so much thank you thank you thank you, thank you so much that wonderful so, comment because that is what we need the learning curve which is there that should be followed and everybody who has become an expert should be the one who should be taking the cases independently then dr vineet mishra sir will be moderating the panel he is director of ikdrc ahmedabad director for the largest public sector multi organ transplant program in india he has been doing pioneer work in gujarat dialysis program the largest public sector dialysis network in india he has been the chairman hospital based authorization committee for transplant and underwent training at university of pittsburgh usa seoul national university south korea he has lots of research in this field welcome dr vineet mishra sir yeah the first case will be taken up by dr chintaka bangala bangala from um, sri lanka he is the senior he is the senior lecturer in obstetrics and gynecology and current head of department of obstetrics and gynecology sir john uh, kotlawala defense university and uh, professor md nankara gold medal for md in part 2 in obstetrics and gynecology got in 2016 and overseas training completed at wips cross university hospital london and he has lots of membership a council member of sri lankan college of obstetrics and gynecology council member of minopa society of lanka member of royal college of obstetrics and gynecology uk and member of perinatal society of sri lanka and fellow of association of minimal access surgery so this is the case number 1 which we have to share yes uh, so uh, we have this young professor from sri lanka and uh, sir there is a case for you which is a 53 year old lady which comes with the complaint of increased frequency of micturition 8 to 10 times a day and history of nocturnia 3 to 4 times at night she complains of sudden urge to micturate which is difficult to defer she is diabetic on medication but fortunately it is well controlled sir very pathetic condition for this patient she almost is not sleeping so my question to you is how will you evaluate this patient sir so thank you very much for the introduction so um for the answer for the first question i would like to discuss in four aspects uh, first one is about the symptom analysis by looking at the initially we can see it's more like overactive bladder symptoms she has frequency she has urgency however she is a patient with diabetes also and there is nocturia associated with this so seems like this uh, more like a uh, Uh, overactive bladder symptoms so we are going to analyze the symptoms uh, mainly the urinary urogynecological symptoms and sexual symptoms and this is uh, a disease of quality of life definitely we have to uh, see because even in the definitions quality of life affection is need to be there to give a diagnosis uh, and medical surgical and the drug history is very important and finally the examination so about the symptoms there are mainly lower urine tract symptoms we cl classically divide them into storage and voiding symptoms like storage symptoms like daytime frequency increase nocturia urgency and urgency incontinence whereas voiding symptoms can be hesitancy intermittency poor stream straining at micturition or terminal dribbling so even though patient tells this is overactive bladder symptoms we have to ask about other storage symptoms as well as voiding symptoms because there can be coexisting problems that the pa patient might not voluntarily come out so it is very important to assess all aspect of uh, lux and then about the incontinence in details because this can be associated with incontinence like urgency incontinence and stress urinary incontinence sometimes continuous incontinence like a fistula also and fecal incontinence the other part and then most of these genital urinary problems are coexisting with each other so prolapse and sexual dysfunction 
we need to assess. So that is about the main symptom analysis. By this, we should be able to get a good idea. Second part is the quality of life. Now, this is, we can just simply ask about the quality of life, but the main domains, if you read through the literature, you will find that the, if you are assessing, especially for, uh, you know, research purposes, there are special domains, physical function, emotional function, uh, how this affects socially and role performance with as a mother, as a, a teacher or a doctor, whatever the profession. And uh, is this associated with pain, sleep, and disease specific symptoms and severity measures. So there are different uh, validated questionnaires made like uh, urogenital distress inventory, UDI uh, version six, and even King's health questionnaire. So if you are really into uh, research for these patients, you can use this, but as day-to-day -day practice, you can use a uh, few domains to assess. Uh, this next one shows, uh, 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 validated questionnaire like this. If you go through internet, you will find a lot of things. We'll move to the next one. So medical surgical history, again, very important because now she is diabetic. Diabetes can be associated with increased frequency and ocular. A very good test to assess overall control over three months would be HbA1c. So I am more preferable to do HbA1c rather than depending on a uh, fasting blood sugar. Neurological history, uh, now diseases like dementia, Parkinson's, or leading to restricted mobility can lead to over distended bladder and overflow incontinence. So we need to ask about your neurological symptoms and drug therapy, especially if they are on uh, treatment for antihypertensive, especially diuretics, they can, uh, it can lead to uh, increased frequency. Uh, then it will be associated with those uh, drug treatment intake close to if they, she's taking frusamide in the morning or HCT in the morning, the morning frequency may be higher. Uh, past surgery is important to manage the plan out, uh, the further management like prolapse or incontinence surgery. So that is the third part. Next one would be to evaluate this patient. Examination is very important. As I said before, general examination, neurological examination is important. And abdomen, we are basically looking at excluding a mass. So pay attention uh, to find a mass uh, because if there's a mass, there can be compression of the bladder and uh, urgency and even urgency incontinence. Uh, gynecological examination is the most crucial part. So when you examine this uh, lady, you might find there's deficiency in the perineum, vulval, vaginal lesions, or atrophic vaginitis is very important because sometimes frequency or dysuria can be related to atrophic vaginitis and urethritis. Uh, stress urinary incontinence, we can ask demonstrable, uh, we can see, and prolapse. Now, levotainai strength. Now, Although this patient is overactive bladder symptoms are predominantly, she is telling, there can be mixed incontinence with the levator and I uh, problems. So there are specific scales like Oxford or perfect scoring methods to assess. These are also mainly used for research purposes. So you can assess and rectal examination will tell whether there is fecal impaction or anal sphincter and check this inner sphincter tone. Next slide, please. So these are just uh, uh, idea about the Oxford and perfect uh, methods. Uh, there are uh, articles on the uh, original articles on how to check on this. So that is uh, my answer to the uh, first question. Uh, shall I continue with the second yeah. question? Uh, yes. Vinit Mishra, I'm asking second question. What is the bladder diary? Yes, ma'am. Yeah. So now I think this is the most important part that we have to understand everyone managing, anyone managing with urinary problems. The importance of bladder diary cannot be stressed enough because it's so important, so informative because patients tend to uh, overestimate and they are uh, not coming up with their sometimes bad habits of water or other fluid intake. So avoiding diarrhea should be uh, maintained at least for three days. Now it includes 
oral intake, not only the fluid volume, but also type of fluid and at what time they have consumed. And sleep and wa awakening time should be noted so we can associate that with the sleeping uh, nocturia as well. Triggering points like exercises or coughing, sneezing, uh, walking, those uh, need to be um, mentioned. Uh, and it can be uh, so used as a baseline to see the effect of the treatment. So we can ask them to maintain it. So this is a simple way of uh, remembering or advising the patient how to use a bladder diary. So wake up time, you have to note and note your drinks. That means not only the volume, but the time and the type of and the measure the urine. Uh, you can use a simple measuring cups and it has to be minimum three days. Standard is three to five days. So next one, please. So this is a, a, a you know, uh, something which is filled. Uh, so like this so type of fluid, uh, the time need to be mentioned, orange juice, coffee, and the amount, and then the urine output at what time and what is there and how urgent. So there are different ways of to do is uh, like a scale, linear scale, or uh, just so know whether there was an urgency associated and also what were they doing and whether there was leakage. So you can, keep your, you can make your own, next one please. You can, we can make your own. So this is what we are using in our hospital. Uh, so uh, we can give uh, like three days, uh, three copies of this to the patient to do it and come back while we are checking the HbA1c and the UF urine reports as well. Next one. So advantages I already told that um, indicate my excessive drinking and bad habits like excessive coffee and drinking close to bedtime. Objective assessment gives it's like an input output chart and also assess the uh, diurnal versus nocturnal volume as well as the 24 hour volume and assess the symptom severity and also it will you know reflect themselves uh, they can reflect and they then they can modify their behaviors thank you dr vinit mishra and yes ma'am yeah, your comments now excellent presentation and uh, especially his elaborated discussion on voiding diary. All of us as gynecologists should, uh, who are practicing urogynecology and patient who comes in, an elderly patient who comes in with any urinary complaint, we just need to have to make them understand about the voiding diary and spend time in taking the history which is of utmost importance. Examination, atrophic vaginitis or vulvitis or estrogen deficiency which is noted, that has to be taken care and we need to see that if there is any psychological thing which is behind that, if they have any depression, or there are any other issues, home issues, or they are staying alone. All those things needs to be uh, nicely depicted in history taking. But excellent thing, Dr. Saib, and uh, it was extremely informative. Okay, second case is for Dr. Hasina Sadia Khan, Associate Pro Professor of Urology, Popular Medical College Hospital, Bangladesh, some or the other, I don't have a CV uh, picture, but I will be showing it later on so that the, everybody can be recognized. So this is your case, Dr. Vinit Mishra. Yes, we have, madam, there is a case of 52 years old woman, postmenopausal for four years, a busy manager with history of depression and sleep disturbance. She had had three termination of pregnancy and one delivery by cesarean section. Several medication taken, selective serotonin uptake inhibitor, two benzodiazepines and a statin. She reports a four 
year history of urinary symptom daily episodes of uui and mild stress urinary incontinence two episodes of nocturia per night she wears pad continuously so madam you have a case which is very typical and you would almost say that 20 to 25% of the patients who deal with post menopausal clinic these patients will be there madam your comments and the stage is yours uh, thank you dr vinit mishra uh, this is a very typical case uh, which we found actually in urology practice too uh the postmenopausal women comes with uh can i share uh, the screen you are not able this is not your presentation yeah this, this is uh, but uh speak from here i am not i am not sharing it somebody else yeah, is I'm sharing sharing it. it for you okay can you go to previous slide first okay so 52 year old woman postmenopausal uh and the complaint is depression with anxiety a uh, sleep disturbance may be due to anxiety and uh his uh obstetric history is not very uh bad and drug history includes that she is taking select ssri and two benzodiazepines and a statin and the main urinary complaint is urgency arch urinary incontinence and mild stress urinary incontinence with nocturia uh, which leads to wearing pads every day so uh, the question was what is the diagnosis and the uh, uh, how to manage this case in history we have to uh, include more uh, informations like caffeine intake any thyroid disorder because we we can see that in our practice the, the, the art, artificial thyroxines also causes overactivity overactive bladder symptoms and the weight of the patient because the overweight patients have overactive bladder symptoms more frequently and as previous doctors say that the frequency volume chart or the bladder diary is very much important many patients comes to us uh, with the complaint of frequency of micturition urgency but uh, when we take history uh, they are complaining that uh, she has burn, uh, they has burn they have burning and they have uh, they are taking lots of water or liquid uh, to avoid the burning sensation post menopausal burning urethritis uh, so uh, the bladder diary is very much important and the quality of life issues that is urge urinary incontinence episodes how many times a day they uh, they have to rush uh, and the stress urinary incontinence episodes number of episodes is also important and how many pads a day she has to change and if she has any pedal edema because in uh, after menopause many patient develop pedal edema many uh, female develop pedal edema so uh, it's important because during night time this edema fluid uh, goes to the kidney and they have to wake up many times uh, to urinate uh, next slide please and on investigation uh, everything was included uh, but i think uh, cystoscopy was performed in that case uh cystoscopy was uh not necessary in this case rather our uh, uroflowmetry may help the the maximum flow rate may uh diagnose the overactivity of the bladder next slide the uroflowmetry and as there was no hematuria or increased P pvr post void residue uh cystoscopy should be avoided in case of hematuria we might think that there may be a uh, in situ carcinoma of the bladder or if the pvr is raised there may be urethral stenosis as in this case there was nothing cystoscopy uh, was not justified in this case 
So uh, next slide. We can uh, see that she has mixed type of urinary incontinence, urgency urinary incontinence, and also stress urinary incontinence. So how can we manage this kind of cases? In this patient, patient is on SSRI. So SSRI has effect on urinary incontinence episodes. It increased the urinary incontinence. Many of the journals showed that it increases the overactivity of the blood, activity of the bladder and increases the incontinence episodes also. So if we switch from SSRI to serotonin norepinephrine reactive inhibitor, duloxetine or TCA rather than using SSRI. And we can switch to short acting benzodiazepines uh, like clonazepam she's taking and stop the long acting dilorazepam because the half-life is high and the uh, incontinence episodes is high in case of a long acting benzodiazepine. And it also causes overactivity of the bladder. And as we are uh, cutting off one of the benzodiazepine, we can add some sleep hormones uh, with that too. So next slide. And the lifestyle changes. Uh, if she is a over drinker, uh, we can curtail the liquid intake. Uh, we advise actually six to eight glass of liquids per day. It also includes uh, water and other liquids. If she's overweight, weight loss and exercise and yoga, timed voiding is very much important. If she voids every half hourly or hourly, we can uh, advise her to increase the time, interval time by 10 minutes uh, per week, and we can reach up to two to three hours uh, interval voiding. And if uh, we can advise her to uh, take laxatives or, or uh, increase intake of vegetables so that uh, her bowel is clear and less pelvic floor problems. And less intake of caffeine is important. Smoking also triggers, so uh, it's also a uh, good advice uh, and resting leg if uh, in raised position, if there is any pedal edema. And the other thing, the pelvic floor muscle exercise and Kegels exercise, and we can take biofeedback. Uh, in worst cases, we can go for sacral neuromodulation. Of, this will act uh, both for the overactivity and the SUI also. And the medical management, we all know beta-3 agonist uh, is the first choice, uh, Mirabegron. And the initial uh, starting dose is 50 milligram. After three months, we can curtail uh, to 25 milligram if the symptom decreases. And if the symptom uh, worsens, we can add anticholinergics with it. And uh, for the SUI, duloxetine is a good option and estrogen cream, local estrogen. Uh, it increases the urethral vascularity and the urethral vascularity is a great cushion to, uh, for continence mechanism uh, along with the strength of the pelvic floor muscle. So local estrogen cream is very much uh, important. We can advise uh, three hours daily for three months, then two, or, uh, two times or once daily uh, for the rest of the life. And if the overactive bladder symptoms uh, uh, cannot be alleviate, uh, elevated by any other measures, we can go for intravesical Botox injection. Next slide. And the surgery, uh, if the stress urinary incontinence symptom worsens, we can go for sling surgery or barge corpus suspension. Dr. Vineet Mishra? Yes, ma'am. Yeah. Very nice presentation. Dr. Uh, Mishra, this question is for yes. you. Yes. Baburam, how are you? Your counterpart is in Ahmedabad. Let yes, me sir. share that uh, tomorrow your counterpart, Mohan, is landing in Ahmedabad. So know, we, discuss, we discuss this case. And okay. Madam okay. Maninda, let me tell you that Baburam is one of the Ayuga Fellowship Program that takes place in Nepal at Mohan 
Mohan Regmi's uh, university, he is one of the pass outs. Am I right, Baburam? Yes, and sir. He is an excellent young person. Baburam, we need an excellent discussion about the case. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. This is the one case so, is one year post me nupar The so seventy one year old post menopausal P five L five all full time normal deliveries last delivery thirty five years ago a trans abdominal hysterectomy for DUB done twenty five years back history of AP repair with proline mesh augmentation done one and a half years back. And complain of involuntary leak of urine from vagina since one year. Bauram, the case is yours. Thank, thank you, sir. There are there is examination part as well. Yeah, that that is their examination part. Supra pubic transfer scar is there. <laughs> then gynecological examination: normal urethra, wide vagina, genital hiatus, and atrophic vagina, perspeculum vaginal urinary leak present. Mesh erosion of 1.5 into 1.5 centimeters seen in the middle third of anterior vaginal bar and per vaginal mesh with scarring felt in the mid vagina. So this is the video you can see. I'll run it again. Baburam, that is that is our diagnosis at the institute. <laughs> Now, what is the diagnosis and how you will manage this case? Okay, Babu thank Ram. you, sir. Yeah. Okay, thank you, thank you, sir. Thank you. Before going, I would like to thank uh, Binit, sir. He is my teacher as well. <laughs> and uh, I would like to uh, thank uh, Miss uh, Madam Auza as well, giving me this opportunity. Uh, thank you, ma'am. And then, uh, because uh, she has undergone one year back, she has undergone uh, uh, the anterior prolapse mess uh, and then for and for that uh, she has a history of uh, urinary incontinence as well uh, it is uh, clear that there is some form of mess erosion or mess protrusion extrusion to the bladder and the diagnosis is obvious i think in my opinion uh, the diagnosis is obvious and it is uh, it must be vesicovaginal fistula because that it is not mentioned that uh, uh, she has stress urinary incontinence or other form of incontinence. She has uh, mass extrusion in the bladder and then uh, she has urinary leakage. And uh, the first diagnosis that uh, should come in our mind is fistula, general urinary fistula. And most probably, since it is mid vagina, it must be vesicovaginal fistula. And, uh, and the next question is uh, how to manage this case? Uh, it is always uh, like it is fancy to do the surgery, but uh, when there is a complication, it is uh, always not straightforward. And then uh, mass erosion and uh, it needs excision. It is straightforward. But the problem is that uh, how to do it? Either we should go vaginal or we should go intravesical or we should go in uh, transabdominal, either laparoscopic or robotic. Uh, I, I think uh, it depends upon the expertise. Being a Eurogyne, uh, to go uh, with the uh, vaginal route, we should excise the mess uh, through the vagina. We can excise it through the vagina, but there are many case studies going through the intravesical as well. And many of the textbook uh, they state that uh, if there is a mess extrusion to the either bladder or to the bowel, we should go transabdominally as well. But in my opinion, being the vaginal surgeon, we should go the vaginal route for the mass accident. And another question is uh, whether uh, VVF repair is possible immediately with the mass accident or we should wait for some time. And uh, it is also controversial and it depends on the expertise. But many of the uh, surgeons, they believe that we should wait for three to four weeks and some say wait for four to six weeks. And then uh, it is mainly to reduce the inflammation and induration uh, that might be present with the um, mass extrusion. Therefore, uh, in my opinion, we should go, uh, we should wait for either three to four weeks or four to six weeks for uh, second repair of the, uh, to go for the basic repair. And another is BVF repair and uh, 
and another question is that uh, whether we should do it either vaginal or other route in my opinion again it is the mid vagina and the uh, bladder bladder perforated in the mid vagina and until proven otherwise we treat the patient of the genital fistula with the vaginal route except for the ureteral vaginal fistula next slide ma'am next possible questions out of for the case which you had mentioned okay ma'am appropriate for this lady what is the role and, of uh, Repair. Okay, ma'am. I think uh, uh, treatment is uh, appropriate for this lady. Only thing, only thing is that uh, the, it is mentioned that uh, uh, she was treated with uh, mace for the anterior prolapse, and it is controversial. And then uh, the mace used in the uh, prolapse repair is always controversial, and uh, in the United States and in many countries now the um, mace for the prolapse repair is uh, it is banned. FDA has banned that. Uh, we should not use uh, mace for the uh, pelvic on prolapse repair during the pelvic on prolapse. Either it is anterior or apical mace. And then, uh, what is the role of yes, Vinesar? Do you have yes. any query? No, no, no. Please, please go ahead. Babu okay, Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. What is the role of mace in anterior, uh, anterior prolapse repair? At least, uh, I already mentioned that the role of the mace in anterior prolapse is always controversial and in some most of the countries is banned now because uh, many studies have found that uh, the, the benefit of the mace it uh, doesn't out, uh, outweigh the uh, risk to the patient because uh, the mace erosion in prolapse repair is more than 10 percent in most of the studies it has been stated that the erosion rate is more than 10 percent and then is there a role of mace in vaginal pelvic or prolapse repair? Uh, as I already mentioned it. And the last question is, is topical estrogen application helpful? And uh, this is also controversial because uh, many of the systematic reviews and the uh, randomized control trial, they have not found the benefit of using uh, prophylactic vaginal estrogen before the surgery or after the surgery. The result is uh, similar in both of the uh, whether estrogen is used before or after the surgery. Thank you, sir. Yeah, Baburam, thank you. Yes. And uh, madam, can I put in uh, one? I'll take about 30 seconds to sum up this thing. The yes. case which you saw, the video which you saw, is the case when we were uh, do we were doing we were doing apogee and perigees. This, the perigee thing, it uh, basically uh, perforated and it was supratrigonal thing. So as Baburam said that vaginally <clears throat> this can be done. So how did this case present? This was a presentation after three to four, um, around four years, four plus years after she had gone a perigee uh, uh, perigee procedure where a fantastic uh, repositioning of the cystocele was done and the vault was excellently uh, put into it. But after four years, she complained of recurrent urinary tract infection and which was not getting treated outside. So we brought her in, did cystoscopy and found out that there was an erosion there. Believe me, 30% uh, of the cases that we had operated ultimately had some or the other type of erosions that took place, especially when it was meant for uh, an uh, anterior, uh, anterior support, uh, that is perigee or an apogee, or even for the apical prolapses, vault prolapses that happened. We found out that if you are using a mesh prosthesis along concomitant with the surgery, the chances of erosion was much higher and especially in cases where they were more than what about 60, 70 years old. So this was the thing and that is how we, we burnt our fingers many times and then ultimately a consensus came that no mesh has to be used 
for any vault prolapse thing vaginally or concomitantly when the surgery is done excepting when you do a vault prolapse case trans abdominally or laparoscopically or robotically and you are trying to place a mesh a y shaped mesh intra abdominally either robotically or laparoscopically or open whichever way you are you are familiar that procedure still had lesser amount of erosion which would be visualized through the vagina but madam one thing that we learned was if you are trying to have this y shaped mesh put intra abdominally and fixed up to the sacral promontory and if we are trying to make a nulliparous vagina out of the vault prolapse the after 2 3 years the mesh starts shrinking and once the mesh starts shrink, uh, shrinking the vaginal vault becomes like a tent and it causes an excruciating pain that is the time you might have to go back laparoscopically usually and excise that mesh which gets which is attached as a y shaped thing on the vault only then the pain comes uh, pain is relieved many complications like perforating into the larger bowel or a smaller bowel have also been encountered which came to us as referral cases so mesh madam and the audience the august audience mesh was really a mesh mesh and which came with a big boom everybody tried it and now it has been totally out and it causes medical legal obligation if any complication takes place if you have used it in a patient thank you the thank fourth you. yeah the fourth very, case very beautiful presentation of a case and very wonderful message that mesh is a mess so it should not be used in the cases with the prolapse yeah now the next case is for the Yeah, done. She is the consultant urogynecologist from the Aga Khan University Hospital, Karachi, Pakistan, and she is the supervisor fellowship urogynecology and pelvic reconstructive surgery college of physicians and surgeons of Pakistan. And she has the Physi uh, physician educator award 2023 accreditation council for the graduate medical education international, and she has the membership of. Uh, Pakistan Urogynecological Association, Society of Obstetricians and Gynecologists of Pakistan, and International uh, Urogynecological uh, Association. Welcome, Dr. Nuvera Chogeti, to our next case. She's from. Thank you very much. Yeah, madam, this is a 65-year-old female, P2 L2, FTND, one live birth, eight years back. and the last birth was 8 years back presenting complaint is stress urinary incontinence since 2 years retropubic tbt sling surgery performed intraoperative cystoscopy done helical needle passes through the bladder you can see this video and if you can run this video no uh yeah Dr. Samit is there. I had invited him to share his screen because I told him many times my videos don't run. Okay. Dr. No Samit, issue. That that's yes. okay, ma'am. I can explain the video. It's it's okay. it's it's a picture. So if um, good evening, everyone. Thank you for having me. I think I should thank Professor Maninder Ahuja and Dr. Batul Mazhar for this, and. Um, Dr. Mishra, I don't know if you remember me, but I met you as a fellow in 2014 in an IOGA conference, and you look just the same. Um, so thank you thank for you. having me. <laughs> thank you, ma'am. And you were with your team when yes, I was. that that big madam, the big yes, madam, Dr. Led, Raila Mohsen. Yes. Yes, Dr. Mohsen led the team from Pakistan. Yes, she did. Yes. Yes, ma'am. Um, so okay, uh, if you go, if you can go back to the video, ma'am. so uh, just for the attendees i would like to explain if you can see uh, that there is a bluish tinge on the right hand of the video and which prob probably is the passing trocar which is uh, 
kept there until the mesh is pulled up in the cystoscopy it helps you in the cystoscopic finding uh, if the mesh is passing through the bladder because mesh is usually white or transparent in color so you can clearly see the trocar passing through the bladder um, so basically uh, what is the management what would be your next step would you stop or would you complete it and how long would you keep the catheter in so basically the re the literature since if you scan the literature from 2010 to 2022 that's what i did for this presentation uh, you can just it's it's not a big thing bladder is a forgiving organ and actually bladder perforation during this insertion is the most one of the most common intraoperative complications of tension free vaginal tape with reported rates from 3 to 6.6% uh, but if it is recognized intraoperatively, that is the best thing that you could do to, to the patient. So it can be easily seen and you can easily redo it. You can take out the trocar and then put it back again. And uh, this is all that you have to do. And then you make sure that you follow it by transurethral catheter placement for about 24 to 48 hours. But if you don't diagnose it, then that's a big problem. It leads to the standard mesh complications of extrusion, erosion, perforation, recurrent UTIs, and all of that stuff. Uh, the next question that was given to me was, uh, what would happen if you have a urethral injury uh, putting in a TVT or a TOT? So the incidence for TVT uh, urethral injury is a little less uh, than transobturator tape. Could you go back, please? Yes, no problem. Thank you. And uh, if you have a urethral injury uh, during a procedure for a mid-urethral sling, then a mesh should not be placed and the procedure should be abandoned, right? Because urethral injury um, usually occurs from dissection in the wrong plane and uh, then the urethral repair should be done. Otherwise, you would end up having a urethrovaginal fistula. It should be done using a 4-0 vicral and the periurethral fascia should be closed. And the catheter then should be retained for longer. That is, the literature says, ranging from 7 to 14 days. So what are the risk factors for bladder injury in mid-urethral sling? Literature says, a Cochrane review done by Ford in 2015 says, that the risk in bottom-to-top approach is lesser than top-to-bottom approach. If you being if you have a TVT done by a less experienced surgeon, obviously you will have more of complications, especially bladder injury. And then surprisingly, if the patient is of age less than 58 years, they would have a higher chance of bladder injury during the procedure because they would have a they would have a stronger pelvic floor, leading to deviation of the trocar when you put excessive pressure onto it. And obviously, obese patients tend to have a lot of fat in the uh, suprapubic region, and that can deviate the trocars as well. Next, please. So, what are there any tests that can detect bladder injury without cystoscopy? There was a recent article that I just got through, and it said, um, "Can we have the next slide, please?" And it said that there, there was you could do a bladder filling test if you're not even doing a cystoscopy because cystoscopy is considered as an additional intervention or invasive test, addition to the TVT that's be, that's being done. So, what they did in the in the a procedure was that they filled the bladder with um, water stained with methylene blue and after the trochar was uh, in, inserted they put in the methylene blue uh, stained water in the bladder and if they could see uh, that blue dye coming out of uh, the urethra or or the suprapubic region that is how they detected um, bladder injury right and then they could then they did the cystoscopy to confirm that bladder injury so um, ideally cystoscopy is a routine good thing to do if you want to be really sure uh, to avoid uh, complications but this is another alternative uh, that you have right it can probably limit the cystoscopy so what are the preventive strategies um, literature again says that if you use bladder deviation techniques with the help of a uh, catheter guide that's basically a steel or a metal catheter guide which deviates the bladder to the opposite side when you put in the trocars. And secondly, um, I read an article from the American Journal of Urogynecology and it says that using the C-clamp technique would help prevent bladder injury in which what you do is you put three fingers on the, on the suprapubic region and with the help of a thumb, you make a C approach and then you push the trocar along with your thumb on the belly of the trocar so that makes sure that the uh, trocar is staying in its right plane 
uh, and not going, uh, you know, not being deviated more towards the bladder. So that is one thing that you can do to prevent all of this, right? Um, you can play the video now. Okay. You can see the trocar on the right side of the bladder going in. And this is probably the exit site of. Yeah, Dr. Uh, Vineet Mishra. Yes. Madam, can I, can I just, uh, this was an excellent uh, presentation by that, by the young urogynecologist. Probably she, what I remember, she went to USA and then probably she has come back and joined Aga Khan University with Madam Mosina. And uh, this catheter, this trocar that we put in, uh, this was an above downwards procedure. And uh, this, uh, when the single trocar is put in, we need to do a cystoscopy. That is what we taught to the our uh, uh, SR senior residents or the fellows. It was very simple, as Mad Madam said that you just need to remove that and go little laterally. And if you have put in the index finger by dissecting it from below and pointing that index finger towards the shoulder, ipsy lateral shoulder, and then you put in the above uh, downwards trocar. And if you are doing a Johnson procedure that is TVTO, TVT, then uh, we need to put that uh, point towards the ipsy lateral shoulder, empty the bladder. And as she had said, we have a metallic stent which puts, which goes through the catheter, follies catheter, and it is deflected on the same side. So the urethra and the probably the bladder also gets deflected on the opposite side. But then also you will have this thing appearing. Please don't get afraid. Just remove the trocar and put it little laterally. So we can go to the next case, which is an open discussion. A 47-year-old a lady underwent abdominal hysterectomy for menorrhagia 15 months back. Intraoperative hemorrhage necessitated multiple blood transfusion. On post-operative day 6, she developed urinary leak. She voids normally in between. Is this urine? Is this UVF or VBF or both? Whether IVP and VG, CUG could be done. On these are the pictures. You could see that there is the lower segment of the right ureter is not being traceable in the in the uh, contrast study. Can I have the next? Cystoscopy and RGP. Cystoscopy and RGP. Yes, a cystoscopy is done and an RGP is done if you could delineate the uh, ureters and if you have an uh, C arm facility along uh, attached uh, in, inside your OT and you do a double DJ stand and if the DJ stand basically goes through and it is placed properly. So then you do again a dye study and everything is in place. Then you have achieved something. You have achieved that the epithelization will take place over it. Fibrosis will take place and we would be, pres uh, we would be preventing a uh, ureteric leak. Next. So, you could see, you could see a uh, uh, lower end, the dye which is being there, probably it is extravasating. Next. Oh, you are able to see a cystogram a bladder which has been filled and you are seeing some of the uh, dye which is there, probably which has 
extravasated, extravasated. Next, this is IVP. Yes. So, the last one. Let us let us have an open discussion. Let us go to Babu Ram and say what he feels about it. Babu Ram is still Thank there. You. Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. Please. Your comments. Sir, I think uh, because he has undergone hysterectomy six days back only and presented with the complaint of uh, continuous urinary leakage, I think that is an embarrassing thing to get it. But uh, but it's possible. Uh, it's, and it is a possible and it's a possible complication as well. I think, uh, uh, first of all, uh, first of all, we should go for uh, diet test, methylene blue diet test, simple blue diet test. Methylene blue diet test. And if it is positive and it is vesicovaginal fistula, and if it is not positive, then we always suspect of uh, urethrovaginal fistula. And obviously, uh, it's always better to go with uh, uh, IVP and it is confirmatory. But the uh, thing is that uh, whether the uh, DJ double J stent that is inserted, is it, uh, uh, is it uh, possible that uh, sometimes it is very easy and it, it easily goes through the ureter, but sometimes it is very challenging and it doesn't go. And the thing is that uh, whether we should wait for the uh, epithelization or we should go for the uh, uretic reimplantation. And that is the main question for this case. And in my opinion, I think if uh, there is DJ stent is uh, easily going, we should wait and then wait for the uh, result. So to the audience, what should we do? Should we immediately operate her? Six days have passed. Then I need a comment from uh, our delegation from Bangladesh and then a comment, a short comment from our uh, Sri Lankan uh, presenters and one comment from, one liner comment from our friends from Pakistan. Uh, so uh, the con at first, uh, the con nature of the fluid should be confirmed by uh, the uh, fluid creatinine level. And it's uh, almost confirmed by the IVP that it's a ureterovaginal fistula. So a cystoscopy and RGP uh, should be performed. Uh, and we may go for a ureteroscopy too. Uh, if uh, there is a small uh, hole in the ureter, uh, we we should go for digestanting for six weeks. And if we found that the, there is loss of more than half the diameter of the ureter, uh, we should go for the repair and the repair should be immediate. And uh, if uh, retrograde digestanting failed, uh, we may try anterior digestanting. But if we find that the ureter should be repaired, it should be repaired immediately. Yes, madam, madam from Pakistan. So I was asked for a short comment and I think I agree. <laughs> that would be the shortest. But yes, I think I want the trainees to focus on the history. Uh, it said clearly that the patient also goes uh, to void separately, right? So that gives you an indication that the bladder is being filled. There is something apart from the bladder that has gone wrong. So always suspect a ureterovaginal fistula if you have a history which says that she also goes to void separately, right? And then she leaks uh, also. Um, so yes, um, if I was the surgeon, I would, I would probably do the same thing. I would see uh, the RGP, I would do a cystoscopy or ureteroscopy, and then if a DJ stent is working for the next six weeks, I would do the same investigations again, an IVU, and then decide if she needs a reimplantation. Thank you, madam. Do we have JB Sharma, sir, or our friends from Sri Lanka? Dr. Any comments? Yes, sir. Yeah, yes, ma'am. Uh, yeah, uh, so... What I would, uh, I would usually do is I would get my urology 
uh, urologically uh, to assess the patient as well. Uh, and uh, in my understanding is uh, a vesica vaginal fistula, if it is a vesica vaginal fistula, sometimes you put a catheter and until the edema settles down and do it later, but ureteric uh, early repair is needed. Um, so I would rather, you know, comply with my urologist to make that decision. But uh, I would agree uh, doing an immediate repair for this patient because it is six days. We need to have comment on how can a sur surgeon prevent we bladder or urate ureteral injury during vaginal hysterectomy? Madam urology, urologist. Yes, thank you, sir. Uh, uh, so, how to prevent injuries from the bladder, uh, uh, pre prevent bladder and ureteral injuries? Um, I think if it's an uncomplicated case of uh, hysterectomy, uh, uh, the, the common surgical precautions uh, would do. And in complicated cases, uh, I would rather prefer uh, pre as in case of a large ovarian mass or a large uh, uh, fibroid, uh, in that cases, or a case of carcinoma, uh, uh, carcinoma cervix. So in that case, in those cases, uh, pre preoperative or preemptive digestanting, bilateral digestanting may save the ureter, and uh, going between the bladder and the anterior wall of the vagina uh, meticulously. Uh, because sometimes the posterior wall of the bladder becomes so thin. Um, so, and if, uh, if after taking all the precautions, uh, there is injury in the bladder, uh, intraoperative diagnosis is the best. Uh, so uh, that has to be keep in mind also. Madam, let me, let me ask you a question. Yes, sir. She has previous two cesarean or she has previous three cesarean and now she has she wants a vaginal hysterectomy to add upon it she has an anterior fibroid which is about four centimeter by three centimeter and it is a sub serosal post vesical fibroid which was diagnosed on an ultrasound <laughs> Okay, uh, so uh, the create uh, in that case, um, uh, preemptive digestanting uh, would help to save the ureter, and uh, the plane between the bladder uh, and the uterus uh, and the vagina should be created very carefully, because there might uh, there may might be adhesion, uh, so this plane uh, should be created very carefully. Is there any role of a lateral window dissection? Uh, yes. Uh, at first, uh, uh, it helps in also in abdominal hysterectomy too, uh, from going uh, from lateral to medial. Uh, the bladder plane uh, can be created uh, very nicely. And if uh, one side gets stuck, uh, we should start from the healthier side. Yes, that is very true. Now, I need to have one comment from Novera. Miss, please come in and give your wisdom. Um, so ideally, with the previous two scars, we've done vaginal hysterectomies on previous two scars with uh, fibroids as well. And the risk of bladder injury is higher than routine, right? Uh, but again, um, I think the best advice for a surgeon is know your anatomy, right? Know where the bladder pillars are. Know where the basic mass of the bladder is. Lateral dissection can help. Probably more so in abdominal versions of hysterectomy. Uh, but again, if you know your planes, you're good to go. Uh, so obviously, we can also dissect because you said it was an anterior fibroid. So what we teach uh, our fellows is that if you come down, if you basically come back from the pouch of Douglas over the uterus, and then put your you place your hand there and then you dissect off the bladder off your hand. It may be using a diathermy, it may be using a metsabam scissor. You know where you're going, right? You're actually above the uterus, you build basically be, uh, in between the uterus and the bladder. So that is a simple, simple technique that we usually teach our fellows. 
<coughs> so that can also help you know saving the bladder okay. thank you madam maninder yeah. you are... have been instrumental in hosting such a nice webinar saida madam would agree to that madam do you do you agree to my comments that madam maninder did all the big uh, thing organizing and bringing all of us to a platform and uh, we should all be thankful to madam Thank maninder you. dr saida please please unmute yourself dr saida please unmute yes i totally agree totally agree i have really enjoyed i have sat sat through the whole webinar and every single presentation every single case we have basically covered the post menopausal urogyny almost completely and all the interesting points and all the controversial points have been very well elucidated what a good program thank you maninda what a good arrangement so dr saida but before uh, we end up i want uh, i will to please share cvs of all the four panelists which were not somehow the by mistake not inserted in the panel uh, so please show them cvs just yes. go them can i have the cvs of all the panelists yes madam and i would like to thank i would like to thank uh, this young person uh, dr yeah, sarkar he is yes. a very very active boy he is doing yes. so much of research and he has so much in writing papers and everything and uh, thank you, you, are thank you so much yeah avi sarkar so we have to thank him and we have to thank all the panelists again shortly yeah. i will just uh, go through their cv very shortly we had four panelists today dr chintaka banagala he was uh, from uh, sri lanka he is the senior lecturer in obstetrics and gynecology and currently heading the department at defense university kotlawala next uh, panelist is uh, dr hasina sadia khan he, she is uh, associate professor department of urology at popular medical college and hospital she is uh, at bangladesh college of physicians and surgeons the next panelist was dr novera ghayur chuptai uh, she is assistant professor at urogynecology and pelvic reconstructive surgery department of obstetrics and gynecology at aga khan university hospital at karachi pakistan and the fourth uh, panelist was dr baburam dikshit he is assistant professor at obstetrics and gynecology at bpkihs dharan nepal so uh, we enjoyed the panel discussion very much it was a lucid and descriptive uh, panel discussion maninder ma'am dr vinith mishra before i thank you from the core of my heart there is one question for you if there is a fecal incontinence then what we do fecal incontinence yes, oh yes fecal incontinence is difficult it is yes. much more difficult than urinary incontinence yes. see i am seeing the uh nodding of the head and affirmation from <coughs> professor saida madam so what happens is madam we need to develop a what is called as cologram and polar or electro uh, myographic study lab for uh, the colon and the rectum and the lower uh, uh, sphincter the area lower to the sphincter if this is there that is the time you we will be able to know that that what is the actual cause for uh, fecal incontinence see many times what happens is the 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 defect not only lies in especially in the diabetic where diabetic patients who develop lot of neuropathies and food habits there is there is a muscular weakness if that happens when you are passing some amount of the gaseous thing which passes out and you are passing a fecal little amount of fecal matter along with that that is one type 
the other is there is an injury to the sphincter the higher up and then you have uh, you just feel like passing the stool and just as you have urge incontinence you will have an urge for the bowel and by the time you reach the loo you have already passed some amount of stool and what happens is by trial and error the patient themselves learn how to manage this so they start taking lesser amount of fluid they start becoming consciously constipated you know cons conscious constipation would take place and once you try and clear that constipation again the amount of what you call incontinent related headaches will start so we need to have a very good lab which basically does the electrophysiology of the rectum the lower part the sphincter and once we have that then we have some devices but the best device is that you need to put them on a diaper and uh, we need to even evaluate the upper intestine a good gi physician is there who will have this irritable bowel syndrome which has because of the higher up uh, pathology these patients they also develop an unconscious just as you have urge for urine you have urge to pass stool by the time they go to the loo they have already passed some amount of stool so that is a more complicated uh physiological thing which is less addressed probably the urologists are not interested in addressing to it and you have gi people who are more interested in the upper part which they usually come up with the diagnosis of ibs but the real lab which which has come up in amdavad we have couple of such labs which have come up and that helps us to give and define where the pathology or there is a disturbed physiology that could be that could be identified and then some amount of neuro regulators could be given to it given to them but those things have effects on the bladder also they have effects on the other pelvic floor also so it is a much complicated very much complicated thing i think so saida madam will agree to that urologists are not interested in dealing with the fecal incontinence no nobody touches that nobody touches and there is nothing like there is nothing like uh, prosthesis there are slings which have been started coming up they are trying slings where they would enhance the angle there is more of such things are there in the elderly people madam and it is extremely difficult and their only solace is a diaper life you know yeah thank you dr vinit mishra i think because we have run out of our time so it's time to say thank you dr avish sarkar or uh, should i thank yes ma'am you can you can thank yeah so at the end i think this has been a wonderful webinar and i have to start from my president dr rohana hotatua our dr saida batul our guest of honor and our incoming president of cefoms and then all the faculty which has been present there from other countries including dr zinnat and uh, dr suraya from bangladesh dr chandra from nepal Uh, Dr. Piyusha Atapattu from um, uh, Sri Lanka was there, and then speaker Dr. J. B. Sharma, Dr. Manoj Chilani from India, and our great great moderator Dr. Vinit Mishra. We just have oh. words to say thank you to you. Just phone call thank and you, we agreed. I have to do this webinar, and there is nothing better person than the experienced Dr. Vinit Mishra, and all our. faculty from the four countries dr sadia khan dr navera dr baburam and dr chintaka mangala from uh, sri lanka my thanks but most of all to dr avish sarkar for being my right hand and then dr jackson uh, jackson pal pharmaceutical dr deepika who is always there to help me to you dr deepika to please uh, right. share your products 
Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Maninder, for this ongoing series and so much of knowledge sharing. Uh, all our uh, doctors are also very much interested to learn everything about menopause, which is so rarely available uh, across all these uh, deliberations which keep happening over the internet. So now here I would like to present to you a few brands of ours. That is Lycored, which is a 100% natural lycopene with phytonutrients. It's available as the patented product Lycomato, which is available in our Lycored soft gel. The ultimate cell protector, which is backed by 35 clinical trials and more than 56 publications now. Also one trial which was done by the Indian Menopause Society for bone and cardio health of postmenopausal women. Also it has anti-oncogenic properties. Apart from Lycored soft gel, we also have Lycored syrup. Uh, we have Verena vaginal gel, healing of the tissues naturally for the postmenopausal women especially. And Divatron, 10 mg tablets of our micronized didrogestron, fully indigenized micronized didrogestron available, which has a shelf life of over 36 months. So thank you all very much and uh, we look forward to the next episode.